sand, fail, square. What do these three things have in common? They basically rhyme if you pronounce them the same way I do. You would expect the way that they're written out to reflect this fact, and it does, they're all written with a long A sound, but just to see how similar they actually are, we can turn to the IPA, the massive system of letters and diacritics that allows us to represent every sound that occurs in every language. If we strip away the consonants, you'll notice that we're left with three completely different vowels, but let's focus on the top one for now. This vowel is what's known as the trap vowel, because it's the same one that occurs in the word trap. If you tested that out just now, you might have realized that it sounds accurate for a British accent. That's because it is. British people say sand. 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 I mean, it's only fair that it is sand. 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 Oh. Who hit the sand? I absolutely did not touch sand. Was that Go naturally sure right falling place. sand? Yes, naturally <laughs> falling sand. But I don't say sand. I say sand. You would transcribe that like this. But this vowel is just an allophone of a that occurs before a nasal. In other words, <laughs> A can't appear in this position, and A can only occur in this position, so it's just a different version of the same vowel. Is there a name for this phenomena? Yes, it's called ash raising, and it's a feature of many North American accents, not just before a nasal, but no one does it quite as well as the Minnesotans. But we're not talking about regional accents, we're talking about general American, which I am speaking about and in. Ash raising before a nasal is just taken as a normal facet of Gen Am speech, as integral as intervocalic flapping or de-aspiration of Porter's consonants after a voiceless fricative. You don't need to know what either of those mean, you can just listen for yourself and hear a handful of sandwiches. Sounds just as weird in an American accent as 30 schools top writing speeches. So it's weird, then, that no online dictionary seems to acknowledge this fact. Here's the Cambridge Dictionary, and it offers to break the word up into phonemes. What's this one? A as in hat? Ah. Bob's your uncle. So that's how you pronounce the A in sand, right? Sand. No. No other dictionary is quite as egregious as this, but none of them care to mention the discrepancy in pronunciation. Even Wiktionary, which, like Wikipedia, is famous for its unbridled support for unnecessary extra information, doesn't care to mention, hey, most Americans pronounce this word entirely differently than the IPA would lead you to believe. This problem is not unique to English. Listen to this Polish word, which means fish. Ryba. What sound would you say the first vowel made? The same as in the word kit or rib? Wow, that's really ignorant of you. The Czech equivalent, Ryba. which is what it would sound like with the E sound, the Polish version uses this vowel. E. That's accurate, right? What do you mean that sounds nothing like it? Let's pop the hood and see what's going on here. Listen to this Russian word. Ryba. That was accurate, right? If not, that's the closest you're going to get. Point is, the Russian vowel spread is almost identical to the Polish, so they use the same IPA letter to transcribe the same letters, even though the sound has drifted. Czech added a long short vowel distinction in addition to the palatized depalatized, so they had to stop and reconsider before applying the IPA to it. We basically have the same thing in English, what we call vowel sets. Basically, instead of coming up with a new set of vowel symbols for every accent, we can create a list of words and refer to any individual vowel based on which word it's pronounced like. This is a pretty neat system, and it allows us to make things more consistent cross-linguistically and across accents. It also has the side effect of COMPLETELY RUINING THE ENTIRE PURPOSE OF THE IPA! I mean, am I going crazy here? Why is this IPA symbol pronounced differently across different languages? Doesn't that just make it a more pretentious version of the Latin alphabet? Why even use the IPA if you're going to use it to show exactly how a vowel is pronounced? Well, the IPA isn't for pronunciation, so to speak. It's meant to differentiate phonemes. So you could argue that as long as Polish has no sound that is pronounced uh, you should be fine using uh to represent I. This is actually the difference between using backslashes to surround an IPA annotation and using angle brackets. Backslashes represent broad transcription, the sounds that we've agreed to use for that language regardless of the reality, and angle brackets represent narrow transcription, the literal, physical sounds coming out of the human's mouth. And you can argue that broad transcription doesn't even need to resemble narrow transcription. But if that's the case, then why even use the IPA for it? If broad transcription is going to use the same symbols to represent different sounds cross-linguistically, then why shouldn't I be able to write it any way I like? At least this one doesn't give you a false impression. And this isn't just some crazy idea I had. Dr. Jeff Lindsay, a man I very much admire, runs a website that uses this sort of text as IPA transcription. It seems like the IPA is useless for broad transcription. So what, we only use narrow transcription and we make up a new broad transcription for every language? Well, that's unrealistic. We can't use narrow transcription because we'd need to use a new version of it for every dialect. Heck, we need to use a new one for every individual. And if we're being really honest, the stuff that narrow transcription tells us, what, 
well, it's not really that important. It doesn't matter if you pronounce it goat or gart or gout or goot. It's all the same word. And if we care to track the exact realizations of phonemes, the IPA is a terrible way to do it. It has 50 different letters to represent slight variations of schwa. It contains a vowel that literally doesn't exist. But most importantly, it divides the spectrum of vowels up into a finite set of symbols. And what? We only care about the changing of a sound if it happens to move across one of the arbitrary boundaries we've set up? If you want to represent the exact, precise sound a vowel makes, we can represent it using a graph or numbers expressing the exact form and frequencies that make up the sound. Or better yet, just use a recording. That's what the Cube Dictionary does. It takes you to this website where you can look at other people pronounce the words. So the IPA is useless for narrow transcription. So the question becomes, what are we doing here? The IPA is useless for narrow transcription, and it's useless for broad transcription. What is it good for? Nothing. Perhaps it's time we bite the bullet and retire the IPA. So I didn't expect this video about sand to get so radical, but I just kept going down the pipeline and now I'm convinced we need to rise up in revolution. Today's video is sponsored by the word subscribe. I don't even have to ask you to subscribe, just by mentioning the concept I've made you consider it, and if you've reached the conclusion that you should, then you will. Alright, bye.